franchise secrets, Eric Von Horn. Hey, this episode, I have uh, somebody that was an early on uh, CEO with Jimmy John's. Uh, Greg is also a, f- a franchisee of Jimmy John's, but he was a CFO, CEO, COO, took that brand from 30 to 300 early on, really was mentored by Jimmy in many ways and has some really interesting things to say. And so we got into some of the things that I never knew about Jimmy John's, Jimmy, and what made that company so great and is so great. One of the things that he said, he just he said that he still owns one of those restaurants, by the way, and he paid his manager $250,000. And so let that sink in. Manager got $250,000 with bonuses out of one of his uh, restaurants. So he's also a franchisor. We just got into so many things. One of the probably the favorite things that we got into is grassroots marketing. What they did at Jimmy John's, what they do now, how franchisees and franchisors can learn about that and how to build a culture where your team lives and breathes your brand. And, and the big secret is it's not easy, but, uh, but this was a pretty incredible conversation. So I hope you enjoy this podcast with Greg. All right, Eric here with Greg Majewski. Greg's done some cool things in franchising. Uh, Jimmy John's, if anybody's ever heard of Jimmy John's, he had a little something to do with that brand. Why don't we start there, Greg? Give us a little bit of your background. So um, I was very, very lucky to get started in the restaurant industry extremely young. Um, And I I was off to go to Arthur Anderson uh, for an international tax uh, specialist as basically a forensic accountant. Um, I had a guy by the name of Jimmy reach out to me and ask me to come meet with him and start a internship. And so I walked into Jimmy John's not knowing a clue about it, anything about him, nothing about the company, never heard of it in my life. And took an internship with Jimmy. And then within three months, I was offered a controller job. Three months after that, I was CFO. Um, Three months after that, I was COO. And about six months after that, I was all of those plus CEO. Um, Joined a company when I had 30 restaurants, left when we had 300 open and 700 sold. So how does a forensic accountant, CFO, controller type person be a COO and a CEO? Because usually they're very kind of different skill sets or personalities. So, I mean, thinking about him bringing you in as an intern, he obviously got to know you and promoted you. So looking back, like, why did he do that? So, I mean, one of the things that I learned instantly in the restaurant business, I paid my way through school through restaurants. Um, I love the industry. I was very lucky to have some incredible mentors that taught me the kitchen and stuff like that as I was going through school. And it just wasn't an avenue that I wanted to get into right away. And I took the accounting side to give me the best well-rounded entrepreneurial type uh, degree as I possibly could get. You can understand numbers, you can understand business. And it sort of was the perfect blend and then work ethic and willing to learn the industry sort of set me apart. So when I first got thrown into Jimmy John's, I was told to go train in West Lafayette, Indiana. And there's an area man- a manager at the store there, Bob Norman at the time. And he worked night shift. So we would play a game with each other that we would get there. Chip was supposed to start at five o'clock. We would get there at four o'clock, work until four in the morning, go home, sleep, go back. Well, every day, because I wanted to be the best, I started showing up 30 minutes an hour earlier and to the point where we were opening, we were putting the key in the door at seven and leaving at four in the morning to learn the industry. And as we walked out of this and after I completed it, the GM looked at me and he said, I got your back. You definitely can be an operator. And so it was just, you have to actually be what you say you are. And most people in this industry are very, very fake and don't understand that the most important thing is your operators. And the most important thing to be successful is that the operators and the franchisees have got to be special. And if they don't feel that and know you understand the pain, you can't be the leader of them. And too many of the people that sit in the community today have never or haven't worked in the industry or the restaurants themselves in decades. And they make decisions from desk. And I refuse to ever be that person. And I got my hands dirty. And that's sort of why Jimmy gave me the opportunities that he gave me. 
So let's fast forward a little bit and then rewind because I want to give, because you mentioned some things in there, like getting your hands dirty, understanding different things. And that's what you're doing uh, now over at Craveworthy. You are a franchisor of a couple different brands. You'll be a franchisor of more brands uh, some, come next year in 2024. And so you've been on the Z side, the Zor side, the corporate side, you, you've seen it all. So but imagine that you run your your brands differently because you've been in so many different seats. Is that fair enough to say? Yeah, I mean, so the thing that I feel makes Crave really different or me different is that I've been on both sides of the aisle. I've been a franchisee, I've been a franchisor, I've been on corporate. I understand how hard it is as a franchisee to make money and that when they make a decision to be your partner and be your customer and buy that brand, they're buying and taking a risk on you. So every decision you make is so important to their profitability. So you've got to be so careful in what you do. Um, so we look at it as completely different. And everyone will say they do this, but not many actually do, is that your franchisees have got to be profitable. And the healthier your franchisees are, the healthier you're going to be as a company. So it's way better to take a dollar on something if your franchisees can make a dollar more because that will come back tenfold. And so we're very, very conscious on our decisions and our build-out costs and our food costs and our agreements to make sure that our franchisees are always winning. Um, and I go out of my way and I'll make less money on the corporate side because long-term, I know that I'll end up winning because they'll win. Um, I always tell people that franchising is a way for someone to experience the American dream. And, you know, it's a way to get into a proven system that you're able to have a better than average success rate not everything hits but you have a better average of being profitable if you buy a franchise um the problem with them today is that too many forget that that's what we're supposed to do is make them successful what um looking back you've mentioned mentors a number of times as i was just reading some things about you you mentioned mentors before we talked the show you've talked about mentors and here you've talked about mentors and I'm a huge believer in, in mentorship. Sometimes I pay for mentorship. Sometimes it's free. Sometimes, you know, the least likely people are mentors to me in, in different ways. So, um, looking back at your time, like where some of the, the mentors that you've had that kind of had some of those play the P or pivotal, pivotal role in, uh, your franchise and entrepreneurial journey. I mean, obviously Jimmy was my biggest mentor. Um, I would not have learned or been where I was without him. I thank him every day for it. Um, so I got to learn somebody who was passionate and uh, excited and always wanting to do and grow and make sure his product was key. Um, I had the honor of having Dave Thomas as a mentor. Um, and we were at an IFA show and he waited to come out of a, I waited, he waited for me to come out of a session to introduce himself because he knew I was a young kid in this environment and he spent and took me to coffee and then called me for two years, every couple of weeks to check on me to make sure I was okay. Uh, and those are the things that I sort of learned. And then the list goes on and on and on. But one of the things he told me was, is that this industry is the greatest industry in the world. And that we, the best thing you can do with the industry is that there's no secrets between us and help people when they come and ask you for help. And then people will always be there when you help. And I've sort of lived my life that way. And I'm very lucky that I have mentors today and friends today that step up when I have questions and stuff like that, because I built those relationships with them. But we go out of our way to sort of work together. Um, not very often will two chicken concepts be friends. You know, that's usually never talk about those things. And I'm very lucky to say Big Chicken and us have a great relationship and we help each other. We talk through things. And that's because... We want both to be successful. There's room for everybody. Um, you know, and that's not normal in this industry. Talk about that a little bit more. Talk about that relationship. Cause I experienced the same thing, Greg, in, in franchising. We have fierce competitors, meaning like we are absolute competitors, but I'm friends with the same people. And we have, you know, and we're in the same, you know, thing called franchising. So, like we have the same goal. We're in the same thing in some ways and we're fierce competitors in other in other ways, but we're friends. So talk about that relationship, that dynamic um, in the in the chicken world. So I mean, it, every in all the restaurants, it's so competitive. You're fighting for the same customers. But the fact that 
you realize that they have great ideas, you have great ideas. They're going through the same issues you go through. And franchising is such a unique industry and has a unique set of problems that to be able to have an open discussion with them about how you handle this, how do you handle increasing build-out costs? What are you doing with chicken prices right now because they went through the roof last year? Hey, how are you handling your multi-unit developments and getting people to open? Having that as a, just an honest thing, we're the only industry that goes through that. And how do you handle a franchisee that's not in their build-out schedule? is like a common one that everyone is talking about right now. And to be able to sit there and pick up the phone and have that conversation and, hey, you know, you're going to be a little bit more forgiving than you normally would. Times are tougher and all that. And mentoring each other through so we can all be successful. It, it's so cool to be able to have those. Um, we've gotten things down and dirty to where, you know, Big Chicken showed me their kitchen and we walked through and, you know, showed me their layouts and they've been into my restaurants and we did the same thing and showed best practices. I mean, that's, we're sharing secrets, but yet, we just want both to win. And the fact that we can do that, I mean, and not be afraid of each other as competitors, it's so much fun. And it makes life so well, much you've easier. Just mentioned, you've just mentioned two competitors. I don't even think you've mentioned your own brand yet. So what is your chicken brand? So we have Bud Long Hot Chicken and we get on. Uh, Bud Long uh, Hot Chicken is a natural based Southern fried chicken concept. Um, in about 1,500 square feet. And Winging On is a competitor of Wing Shop. And, you know, we do that. Um, and they recently just won Best Wing Sauce in America at the Buffalo Wing Sauce Competition uh, last year. So um, very, very cool two brands in that front that we're franchising today. So I'm a non-food guy. I've been in franchising for 20 plus years. Never really been into the food in the food world. I have friends that are. I was just at the multi-unit conference in Vegas and tons of food concepts there. Franchisees that are flying in on their nice private jets because they make so much money in food and they're looking for the next thing. I talked to somebody that looked like a normal person. All of a sudden you realize they own 50 of this, 30 of that, 100 of this, and, and you know that they are doing very well. What is it about food that allows franchisees to scale like that, to go from one brand to the other? Because a lot of people that are not in food think it's so risky being in the food world or the QSR world. So educate me, educate my audience on why like your concepts are amazing because I really don't know. So with food, the one thing that everybody always needs is they need to eat. And so food is the uh, international avenue for growth because no matter what, as the population continues to get away from home cooks and stuff like that, restaurants have become an everyday occurrence of everyone's life. And because of that, you can have multiple restaurants and all this and have that eat because you know that if the product's good, you have an eat with customers day in and day out. Um, there's the other side of franchising works too. There's the gaming, there's the trampoline, there's the amazing things, but with food, you can put something in almost every corner and you can own a DMA with seven different brands and not cannibalize yourself. Where in the other industries, you can only put one maybe in that DMA. Where with food, you can go and find a bunch of different things and have all your operations in one little circle where you can then have the synergies between your DOs, your accounting staffs, your stuff like that because they can run multiples in that same vicinity. And that's why people have found food and such a winnable thing can get to that point. The other thing is, is that food has been around a lot longer than the other ones. So there's always stores for sale so you can scale a lot faster, especially on those older brands. Um, so you can see the people that buy up KFCs and Taco Bells and stuff like that buying groups faster because people are now in those retirement stages of those brands and new blood can come in and scale extremely fast. And then it's the people then that want to hybrid right up. The old and the new. No, go ahead, please. You know, and that then allows them to have the footprint of the old, and then they can put the new brands around them and have that white space and that growth. What about that man management infrastructure? Because a lot of people think like, a lot of people love these semi-absentee businesses, you know, under $300,000 to get into. And, you know, it might take a year to um, six months to reach cash flow break even or maybe a year to reach cash flow break even and they hope to recover their 
initial investment in three years. In the food world, I believe, and educate me, again, educate me on this stuff, but I believe I, you open up. It's, a, it's not cheap to get into, but once you open up, you are running at full capacity or near full capacity because people are ready for it. There's built up demand and, and you have instant customers. So educate me on like the, the path to profitability and, and what the customer like adoption is. So restaurants are for sure. You would, I tell all my franchisees plan in a year. Uh, not making money and investing back in your business and stuff like that because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and, but then the reverse side is that if you're doing your job right, you can scale extremely fast because if the product's right, you run a good operation, word of mouth, and people want to try the new cool restaurant that opens in town. So if you're able to function and you're able to get through, you can be profitable day one. Um, and the nice thing about food is that there's no real top line of any of these brands yet. Uh, look at what Chick-fil-A did. Who would have thought Chick-fil-A would be eight point some million dollars per location? Um, it's ungodly, but that's because they continue to find ways to increase that top line. And that's the wonderful thing about restaurants is that you can continue to increase that top line year after year after year if you're running a good business, if you take care of your customers, serve good product, and have great service. Um, in all sides, I think restaurants have the bigger upswing of what's out there because you can then move faster. And if a location is not working, yes, you put some money in and stuff like that. But if the location changes and the time changes, you can pick it up and go again. And the brand's not bad. Demographics may change a little bit, but you can continue to develop and pop up and have a group of restaurants that become very, very profitable. Um, I never tell people that one is where they should be. If you're going to go into the restaurant business, going for one franchise is not going to be the long-term success that you need. It's once you get the scale of three, four, that you can start seeing real life-changing investment and money coming back to you. Why three or four? Like what happens when you have three or four? I understand there's economies of scale and, there, it's and, there's, the, and it's I'm the sure it has to do with you, your leadership team. Yeah, well, it's the synergies. It's that. It's the fact that you have the wherewithal to get through when each little area goes through trends and trends continue to evolve. So new restaurant opens up, you go down a little bit over there, this store opens, you go up, you're then able to balance out and have a true level playing field. When you have one restaurant, one thing could go wrong. Construction in front of the restaurant where you can't get into the sidewalk and have to walk over things. I mean, it could be the death of you for four years. Um, things that are out of your control. So once you have a group, you can sort of stomach those absurd rules and then I mean, COVID is a perfect example. You know, urban stores died, but if you had urban and suburban, you were able to survive. If you just had urban stores, you bled for a year, you know, for that time. There's just there's benefits in being diversified in where you are and how many you had. So you, let's talk about well, let me ask one more question related to food. Then I want to kind of go back into some of the Jimmy John stuff, things that you learned, how you increased top line, and just you know, I mean, you were there from thirty to three hundred. So I want to I want to dive into some of the learnings that you had. But um, to kind of finish up on this food discussion, a lot of brands out there, again, from an outsider's perspective, only want franchisees with restaurant experience. There doesn't seem to be a lot of food concepts out there that will take on a franchisee without food experience. So can you like comment on that, please? So the brands that do that do it because it's the path of least resistance. And so back in the day at Jimmy John's, we would take the best people because we believed our system could create restaurant operators. And today people want people that have already done it so they don't have to work as hard to make them successful. And in my mind, that's bad franchising and bad brand development. So I believe you can, if your system is right and you're franchising and it, so it should be, you should have the tools set up, the systems in place that you can train anybody to run your restaurant. If you have those things in place, then anybody can be a restaurant owner because it's our job as franchisors to make you and give you the tools so you can go walk into the job. The brands that are only requiring restaurant people are doing it because they don't want to have to train the basics again. And to me, that's just weak and, you know, easy. Um, why write off half of the country in my mind? You know, everybody should have the same opportunity. And if you're good at what you do, you should be able to convince them and treat them and teach them through your system. 
All right. That's good. Thanks for that education. Because um, I've, I've asked that question to different people, and that was a, a really good, concise answer and some things I hadn't heard before. All right. Let's get back to Jimmy John's um, and your time there. Um, I, w- I, I eat Jimmy John's often uh, because it's freaky fast, and it really is. So were you there when you kind of uh, that strategy came on? Like, I think you, you were shifting some marketing strategies around that time and kind of more grassroots and and uh, and freaky fast came about. Yep. So were you there at yep. that time? So, I mean, we Jimmy Johnson had always delivered. It was part of his point of differentiation since the day he started. Um, but the focus on being the sub so fast you freak and five minute deliveries and all that really took place um, when I got there. Um, and that was something that Jimmy drove down to us. And if you can get a sandwich in someone's hands and consistently in under five minutes or under 10 minutes to them, they're going to order from you more often. So we took a very, very conscious effort of focusing all of our thing on what we were different as everybody else and driving that message home and the service home to be able to deliver like that. And when we made that big push, there was only two things that delivered in America. There was pizza and Chinese food. Those are number one and two. And I say it all the time, there would not be DoorDash, or Grubhubs or anything of that if Jimmy Johns didn't do what we did on the delivery side. Um, change the perception of what could be delivered to the American consumer day in and day out. And we did it better than everybody. I mean, we were the kings of delivery. And to this day, I will still say they are the best delivered product out there. How risky was it? How much pushback did you, did, was there an internal meetings on like, this is the direction that we're none. going? There was absolutely none. We all sort of got behind it and believed in it and, knew that that was what we were different. We were already delivering. So, I mean, there was absolutely no pushback in this avenue. It was the smart thing to do. Now, not everybody understood why we were doing it, but we all understood that we could affect and grow top line by adding 40, 50, 60% of our business came through delivery. I mean, and that was unheard of. So that allowed us to have small footprints and 900 square foot stores and allow our franchisees to build out these small stores for under $200,000 back in the day, but do $1.1, $1.2 million, you know, because it was all delivered. I mean, it was, it was the greatest thing in the world. I mean, when we were doing that and we were firing, our franchisees were lining up because you couldn't do that volume out there. So how does, so you understood like you were doing more delivery than, well, nobody else was doing delivery, but you understood the, um, the, the revenue stream that came from delivery, how large that was. And so that was one of the things that gave everybody confidence just to double down on that. Yeah. And I mean, and we knew that our product was better and this allowed us to get it to more people in a faster way. Um, and so I, Jimmy's idea when he started it with delivery and own delivery was, you know, way ahead of its time. Um, and then we were attached to sort of make it and make it better and continue to push it. And everybody bought in. Our drivers made a fortune. So they were excited to do it. Um, we had a policy that you would take one order. So think about that. In today's world, Grubhub guys come up and they cheat and DoorDash guys come in and they cheat at four phones and they're taking four phones worth of orders mm-hmm. as they come into your restaurant. Even though they're only supposed to take one, they they find a loophole. We sent drivers out with no more than two orders at a time and they had to be in the same zone so we could get there fast. And so we would have to hire more drivers at the time to make sure that we would get a customer to what they expected it to be. Now it became a crutch for us later like today, it's hard for us to still do that because drivers are so hard to come by. But the fact that we did it for so long and that our customers are so in tune to being, hey, you can order Jimmy John's, that will be here in under 10 minutes. We still get people saying, man, my Jimmy John's took 11 minutes. You were slow today. Uh, I mean, it's just it's an, an incredible feat. And we built the entire Looking brand back, on that. You... Uh, how big did you think that company was when you had 30 locations? Did you think you're going into a pretty decent sized company realizing it was going to be mat? You probably didn't know it was going to be massive, but like, how did it, how did, how did that growth feel to you going in at 30 and then eventually going to 300? I didn't know any better. So, I mean, nothing seemed non-achievable. So when Jimmy and I first met, we laid out a sort of a deal that we joked that if I could get it, if we could get to 200 restaurants, we'd be in something. And, you know, and everybody looked at us and was like, no, you know, and no way. And I mean, we just kept staying true to what we believed the brand was. 
and the driving of the success of the brand and that we slowly got there. And then we got there way faster than we probably should. And then they got to 2000, you know, 500, 1000 and continue to grow after I left. But I mean, it was because we offered something different and we sold our stores to first time people that then bought in and were successful and then didn't want to leave the brand. So they were buying two, three, four, five, six, seven stores, but they were just making so much money with us. And I mean, that's the, I mean, if you want to have a successful franchise brand, if your franchisees are winning, they're going to continue to buy. They're not going to look for other options. Attention, franchisors and franchisees. There are two really important resources that I want to share with you that will help you avoid costly mistakes and increase your enterprise value. The first is our free Facebook group. It's a community that has over 4,000 franchisees and franchisors in it. When somebody asks a question, they get honest and authentic answers from multiple perspectives. You can join the group for free over at franchisesecrets.com forward slash Facebook. The second resource I want to share with you is if you're a franchisee and you want to be around a community of successful Z's and other brands and in other industries, this is why I created the Franchisee Mastermind. If you want access to the best single and multi-unit owners to know what they're doing, or if you want to be around other multi-brand owners, then you'll want to check out my Franchisee Mastermind. The reason why people join is they want access to my Rolodex, my connections, to each other, they want to shortcut success, both short-term and long-term. Links will be in the show notes or at scalablefranchise.com. So people see a bunch of Jimmy John's out there. They see a bunch of Subways out there or what, you name the brand, whatever it is. A lot of people don't know how successful these franchisees are. And like what you just mentioned, franchisee success, it le lends itself to just fast franchisor growth because they're buying more and buying more. What was it? What was it that made them profitable? So why were they making money when other sandwich shops were probably not making as much money? Because we had, we weren't dependent on where our locations were because we offered the delivery component. So we could go into a B location back in the day because we couldn't afford A's and we could go into the B location, but do A numbers at rents that were ridiculously cheap. So I still own a Jimmy John's today where my rent on Ohio State's campus is under a thousand dollars a month. No way. You know, to this day. And I mean, I do over a million dollars in volume in that store. So just imagine what the profit point is. But because I'm in such a small space and I'm not on that A street, the returns back then were huge. Um, and I've been, I've had that store now open for over 20 years. And I mean, it just it compounds and compounds and compounds because we cared about where we knew and we could go into places that other people couldn't. Um, and so when did you get into, when did you be become a franchisee? So like at what stage were you going from, you know, uh, controller to franchisee? So one of the things, and when I first negotiated my contract with Jimmy, I wrote in that I could be a franchisee while I was still working for the company. And he did not know if I had the money, he didn't do all that. And, but I knew instantly that I wanted to be a franchisee if I was going to take this job. And we wrote it in my contract. And so I became a franchisee a year after I started working there. And I started building my franchise company and I was there. So because I believed in the so brand, if I was going to work it somewhere, I wanted to be all in on it. How did that, did you get pushed back from franchisees saying, hey, you're already, you're working for it here, working for the, the franchise or now you're distracted by being a franchisee as well? Was there any, any of no, that chatter? Hired, I hired an operator to run it um, and be that focal point, but I also wanted to understand the pains that we, our decisions made. So for me to understand that when if I, you know, increased above out cost, what was that effect on a franchisee? I wanted to know what they were going through on the, as a franchisee, not just as a corporate employee. And since I was new to franchising, it was really, really important to me to understand what every decision I made, how it affected them. And so that's why I wanted to do it and why I enjoyed doing it. And I can have continued to do it here. I own, uh, for example, I'm a franchisee of Kingus, you know, the other brand that we do. I did that so I can understand the troubles and the issues that my decisions make. So I stay in tune to that bottom line differently because Royal King is a different expense. So yes, corporately, I may make 12%, but my franchisees pay 6% to me. They're only making 6%. That's a sh bad, bad thing. So <laughs> I want to understand what that does. So I keep myself in tune continually to also be bold 
so I can understand everything that they're going through. I bought, um, for example, two BDs, Mongolians, and are also a franchise company that we're not using right now. I bought them from the franchise, a franchisee last year, so I can understand what they go through and what the decisions are. I feel that's an important feeling for somebody to actually be good at what you do. Who did Jimmy learn from? Who was a mentor of his? Because I heard you mention Dave Thomas, and I've had some uh, people that I know that were mentored by Dave and just amazing stories, amazing stories with him, like early on when, you know, going through the drive through with them. And so lots of respect, but who do you think some of the, the mentors that Jimmy had to be able to, I mean, you know, help him shortcut the process? I know Jimmy Cutler and uh, Coulter was a huge mentor for Jimmy. I know he had relationships with uh, the Papa John's group back in the day, Rick Sherman, um, you know, the Lone Star group was all the Glenn Dennings. I mean, so he had a continual stream of great people around him to sort of help him mentor him. And his personality was always so big. He never had a problem to pick up the phone and just ask um, if he didn't know something and all that. Um, so his mentorship, though, those were the ones that I remember being there for him all the time. So looking back, like, what what's something that most people don't know about Jimmy, his leadership style, decision making that you know and have a lot of respect for? So, I mean, the biggest thing with Jimmy was that you and it what I've learned and continue is that no is never an answer. Um, so there's nothing that we can't do as a group or there's nothing that you can't do. There's always a way to find a way to make it work. Um, and that was always his biggest thing is that no matter how hard or how much of a struggle it was, you had to figure out a way to figure it out. There was not a no if that was what was best to do. Um, he was extremely passionate. Um, he was an extremely, he was a guy that had always wanted his team to win, um, always wanted to get back to his team and make sure that they were successful because at the bottom line, he knew the more successful his team was, the more success that he would have because they'd work harder for him. Um, and we, that context and rewarding that is something that I live by every day. Um, if you take care of the people that work for you, they're going to go to battle for you time and time again, harder than they ever did. And they know that you're going to have their back. And Jimmy was the best at that. Let's talk about just, you know, developing new revenue streams, how to increase top line. Um, cause I think you're pretty darn good at that. So. Talk about like how you increase top line over at Jimmy John's, how you think about it in the brands over at Crave Worthy today. Because that top line helps the franchisor, obviously. Top line, you make money off a of top line. Top line revenue helps franchisees. And so you always want to be increasing that top line because expenses are always increasing with build out and food costs and labor and all of this other stuff. So just give us some of your mindset around increasing top line revenue for franchisees. So at Jimmy John's, we, back in the day, we had a no discount policy. So everything we did was with that discount. We would give away a free sandwich to get you to try us, go out and sample and all that, but we would never discount the product. Now that's changed over the last couple of years. Um, and now with loyalty and tough, we're a little different, but we always believed that if you served your customers right and you were sponsoring and giving stuff away and out there, you would grow top line organically. Um, I'm still a big, big believer in the grassroots marketing effort when you open a restaurant because you can't compete with most people on media and all this other stuff. And so it's important to go out there and get your name out there. Um, it's important to get your menus in your hand, get people to try your food. Um, if you really believe in what the product is, the best way to win customers is get them to try it because then they're going to come back time and time again. And so that's something we do with all our brands. Um, and that's always been the easiest way to grow sales organically. In today's world, most of these companies that are announcing huge sales growth and all that are not telling everyone the full story. Um, and that is that transactions are on a steep decline because we've taken price so many times in the last three years. Um, so at Crave Worthy, what we actually did this past November is that we lowered our prices on everything. And instead of raising, we What do you lowered, mean by that? You lowered the price to the consumer to the or consumer. lowered the cost to- To the okay. consumer. So we actually took price cuts um, on our brands and our products to get consumers back in because we saw that we thought what was going to happen was going to happen and that people were going to start tightening their pockets. So we've seen an increase in transactions and we're down slightly in sales, which means as a franchisor, I'm hurting, but we're setting ourselves up for the long run 
to make sure that our franchisees get the people and that they need to have in to survive whatever's coming. So we convinced everybody to go out with new menus and stuff like that and take a little bit of a hit now, still be profitable, but increase your transaction count because long term, the only thing that matters in any business is how many customers come in every day. And too many people are getting pets on the back for 17% sales growth when 17% sales growth is all price, you know, but transactions are down 15%. It's not a sustainable model. So we went the other way with it to try to fight it. And organically, amazing what happens when you take a price cut. Customers start coming back, you know, and realizing that, hey, you're a good deal. This is a great sandwich for six ninety nine. You know, and, and all this. And now they're coming in more often. And what ends up happening is sales are going to start to go up. And so we've took a little bit of a different approach and how we're going to build that top line number um, than most have in this industry. Let's dive into to, uh, grassroots. Is that pretty common in the restaurant industry, food industry to have a focus on grassroots? Or is that something that you guys did at Jimmy John's and you're doing yourself? So I would say no. People talk about it, but very few companies actually do it well. Um, Jimmy was a big, big believer in it, and it was all that we had the money to do. So how could we build sales when we had no other cash? And it was to go out there and zone and drop off menus and all that, and it worked. Um, so it's something that I continue to believe in um, because I've seen it being successful so many times over and over. You don't have the capital to go anyways. Um, the bigger groups and the bigger brands and the thousand, two thousand units, they tend to forget about it. And, it, you know, it's something that you should continue to do because the restaurants are part of a community. And if you're going to win in that community, you actually have to be a member of the community. And by doing that grassroots marketing and being there and sponsoring and giving back to your local groups, that's how you're going to win those customers for life. And I don't think you should ever stop that. Um, I think that should be a prime focus of every restaurant every day. Give me more of that. Give me more of grassroots marketing. Cause I want, cause there's a lot of franchisees and franchisors that listen to this, Greg. So number are in the food space. A lot are not in the food space. So like what can other brands learn about grassroots marketing? Cause I think franchisees out there, they hope they can just put an ad on Facebook. They can do all this stuff, which it's all, all that stuff's increasing. Facebook ads are increasing. Reach is decreasing. The value that you get from that is is just not what it was two, three, five years ago. I'm a big believer in grassroots. I got my start in franchising with Liberty Tax, and it was all about grassroots because, to your point, we didn't have the money as as like like H and R Block did. That was the big competitor. We weren't as big as Jackson Hewitt. We had to do grassroots. That was our secret weapon. So, like, what are some of the things that you think uh, if you were to speak to a thousand? franchisees or 10,000 franchisees that listen to this podcast, what would you say to them to, uh, to give them a, a handful of tips to grassroots market their location? So, I mean, the biggest thing that we always talk about and what we tell is that when you go out, every customer that you ever, every person you run into every day is a customer in the restaurant industry. And so it's being addressed properly, going above and beyond, having your logos and your uniforms, feeling willing to talk about what you you do, having your team buy into that and have them wait uniforms that are cool that they want to wear when they're not working. Um, that was one of the big things. It's having menus and when you go out, you know, putting menus everywhere you go, even though you're off duty, but dropping off menus when you're walking into the mall, stuff like that. Take every opportunity because every one that you get is a you know, a customer that will spread that repeatedly, sponsoring the local teams, going to the baseball fields and handing out free cards to the kids after they come off after a game to come in and try your restaurant and give away a free kid's meal. Never say no or think that any idea is a bad idea when you're doing grassroots um, and being constantly looking for those opportunities. But the thing people forget, that's hard work, you know, and it's hard work to go and build sales. And so everyone wants that magic pill where you just go ahead and say, oh, I'm going to place that ad and you forget it. But the way to really build it is to continually have a plan, develop an action plan, follow that day in and day out, and then repeat it. You know, hit your entire zone or what you think your customer base is and then start again. So we have a sort of, we lay out a grid system in my brands where we lay out a grid of where we think our customers come from. And it's usually a five to seven minute drive time. And we lay that out and we start with the closest grid and we put the store in the middle 
And we start there and then we go around the grid around. Once we go around, we repeat again. Then we go to the next outer layer and go again. Then we hit the zones that we've already hit three times, hit them again, do those again, repeat. And we do that continually every day and that it's just part of our culture that we send somebody out. So we say, get out, hand out 50 menus every day. You know, that's, that's the bare minimum that we're allowed to do. Drop off three food drops every day. You know, um, in the Jimmy John's world, it was 50 samples every day. Go to some office and the people as you walk around. Keep us fresh in mouth. And magically, people still don't know what Jimmy John's is, even though we've been around now forever. We get a customer that goes, oh my God, I've never had this. And really? You know, it's amazing. And we're right here. Come on in. And, you know, we create new customers. It's continually to do those type of things, but it is hard work. Um, but restaurant industry is not easy. And running other franchises is not. You can't depend on your franchise core to spend all that money and you drive traffic all the time. It's up to you. And you, it's your business. And that's the great thing about this model is that you can be five times more successful than any corporate franchise location can be because you you can force yourself to do so much more and build that top line so fast if you're willing to actually put the plans together. I love that. And and what you said is so true. You think about a system like Jimmy John's and 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 any system, but a system that has grown where or even in your market, let's say you have three locations in your particular DMA, your market, you think everybody knows about you because you've visited every business or every every place that your customers might be three times or 10 times or 12 times, they really don't know you as well as you think that they do. One of the things they might want to ask is, do you know where our location is? Do you know where we are? Have you heard about us? When was the last time you ate here? When was the last time you sampled this? When you know, So you start to understand that e- because you live it every day as a franchisee, as a manager, you think everybody knows about you, where you are, what you do, how you do it, how great you are. But the truth of it is, They don't, they're not, you don't have the brand awareness that you think that you have. And uh, I found that to be true as uh, early on when we had 42 locations in Liberty Tax in Austin, Texas. I thought everybody knew where we were until I would go out and start to sample and be like, how many people actually know who we are and where we are? And I was always surprised. I thought we would have 90%, you know, ratings of like, everybody would know where we, where we are. Wasn't even close to that even though we were really aggressive with grassroots. So that was a, that's a great point. How do you build the culture? How do you build the culture for your employees to want to wear your logo, your, your, your swag and to give out menus when they don't have to? Like, how do you, how do you do that? It, that comes from you and you as an owner and you living it and doing it. So, I mean, uh, yeah, would it be awesome to wear a non-logo shirt when I go somewhere and not have one of that? Oh, of course, but you'll never see me without my brands and my logo and advertising what I do every day, no matter where I go. My wife laughs at me. Are you ever going to wear something besides a black or white polo? No, I'm not. You know, it's because this is how we build what we do every day. And so if you live it, you preach it, you do it, they'll start to do it. Not everybody, but They'll start. And then if you start sending them out and you see the importance and you allow your management team to win on the success, they'll do it night and day. If they know that they can build sales a hundred thousand dollars in a year, which is going to draw 20 to 30% to the bottom line and they're a profit sharing partner. You don't think they're going to go out there and help build those sales. You got to make that interesting and want them to win. That's how you build a culture in sort of doing it. So you've got to entice your management team to know that, hey, we're going to, you're a profit sharing partner. Let's build sales this year, a hundred grand. That's 30,000. You get 20% of that. That's another $6,000 in your pocket that you can earn. You don't think they're going to go drop off some menus on their off time? Of course they are. Um, because that's a big number. And then as that continues to evolve and roll, you continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger checks. So I'm a big, big believer in, um, having my operating partners share with me in my wins on the corporate side or on as a franchise owner. So, I mean, I give away as much as 30% of my profit, depending on the longevity of some of these GMs that they get if, in a bonus pool if they're successful. So last year I had a Jimmy John's manager that made $255,000, you know, running no one of my restaurants. Wow. And you don't so think that person will do anything? profit sharing. 
I mean, that person runs through walls. Hundred percent. Yeah, that you want somebody that you want a manager, a partner that will run through brick walls for you. And this is how this is how you do it. How do you like? How do you structure profit sharing? So um, we start on a sort of a basis of longevity. So when you first start, you start as a ten percent profit share partner. If you hit eighty percent of your bonus in a year, you get to go up to fifteen. If you don't hit eighty percent the following year, you go back to ten percent and you start the trend again. You can go up as high as thirty percent. If they're hitting eighty percent of their bonus, you're as an owner are just you're making a ton of money. You know, so there's no reason not to give that away. So we came up with a system that keeps them here long term by continuing to up that ante as long as they're doing their job. And obviously if they've been there long enough to get thirty percent. They're running the best store you possibly have. You don't have the same time commitments and everything else that you got to put into it because they're self-sufficient. And then you can work on some of the other stores that you have. Um, but I mean, our bonus program is very, very basic. Hit food, earn 25%. Hit labor, hit 25%. Profit, hit 25%. Because sometimes you don't hit profit and there's got to be something. And then the bottom is basically a combination of the peak scores or ROEs that come in that it you know, you have to have an X amount of sore to make sure you're following the systems that are in place. Everything that they control, you know, and nothing that they don't control. Any the only bonus them for the things that they can actually fix in the restaurant. If you're a cheap owner and don't fix the tile and they get marked out from Dale for something, that's on you, not them. Still bonus them for their great work. That's real true. I think about this. Everyone out there, Z Zors, business owners, like uh Reward them for the things that they can control. Don't ding them for the things that they can't control or don't not reward them for the things that they don't have control over. Because if you start doing that, that they're not really, if, you, if, if they're a frontline worker where their job is just revenue, like they don't have any control over expenses and the, their, their, their bonuses um, is based off of controlling expenses, they're not really motivated to do that. So bonus the people that are on the front line that the only thing they could control is the top line, then bonus them off a of top line. Is that kind of what you're saying? Uh, we bonus off a of bottom line, but we set up our P&L for the pure fact that they none of the G&A expenses that are above store, they're bonus on. They're bonus only on the store level expenses that they can control. So yes, exactly what you're saying, but then have the owner expenses and everything else as its own GNA category. They don't control that. If you want to yes. have a car that's $1,500 a month, don't charge your stores yep. a car. Let them control yep. the expenses that they actually have control over and win on those. And if they're winning on those, you're going to be able to afford a nicer car. So who doesn't get bonused in, 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 out of the employees. So who, we do, who are the ones that don't we do involved? management team only on the bonus level. And then we believe in the paying a above wage to get the other people to come in. Um, so you won't in, you work for me. You never, we're never the lowest person on the block. We want to pay more than a fair wage to keep our staff and not have them jump for pennies and dollars down the line. So we're overpaying our employees um, to make sure that, because we don't want to continually go through the retraining process. Um, but the management team then builds the culture because they're the ones that are winning in the bonus pool. And so it's any salaried manager or shift lead is eligible for our bonus program. So it's less expensive to overpay for an employee because you have less employee turnover. Oh, God, yes. I mean, it, it sounds so simple, but nobody wants to do it because you're so worried about that labor cost. But the fact that you're constantly battling for people with everybody else and you're cheap, you're going to be training and people are going to jump for a quarter. So why not just pay 50 or 75 cents or a dollar more an hour so you don't have that problem and you keep people for the longevity first and then you don't have to spend two weeks training someone and your service stinks during that time, you know, because you can't have extra bodies today. They're not available. So it's so important to retain the people that you have. So, um, Greg, tell people just real quick about your brands and how they can find you. So um, we are a platform company called Crave Worthy Brands. You can find all of my brands at craveworthybrands.com. Um, but the three brands that we're most excited about today that we're franchising are Bud Long Hot Chicken, which is a small footprint, uh, Southern fried hot chicken, Nashville style um, concept. 
uh, Wing It On, which is a wing competitor of everybody else, but actually has award-winning sauces that have won wing sauces at uh, the Buffalo Wing Sauce Competition. And then Gingus Grill, which is America's number one bowl company. And we're the only concept out there. There's nobody else else like there where you can go and pick all your fresh ingredients. We'll turn and cook your board to order. And not one item sits on the steam table like our my competitors. Not one item is pre-cooked. Everything gets turned and cooked and off the flat tops in under five minutes. And you get a home-cooked meal or under five. So if you're interested in any of those, check out uh, Crave Worthy Brands. And uh, Greg, this has been fun. You've educated me and the audience on food where, again, a lot of people have misconceptions about it and or just they're not educated on that world. And I've been excited to have you on just to talk about, you know, your experience over at Jimmy John's early on, because it's such an amazing brand to have someone on you that was there early on in the formation of some of the cool things that they ended up doing was fantastic. Any last bits of wisdom, anything you want to leave the audience with before I let you go? No, I mean, just when you choose your franchise or when you get into the side, make sure it's something you're passionate about um, and then go all in because it is one of the greatest industries out there. Um, franchising is an incredible opportunity for everybody. And if you work hard, you will be successful. And it doesn't matter what the franchise or does. If you run your restaurant correctly or your brand correctly. It's really up to you. It's your only little ecosystem that can continue to produce forever. Well said. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Links to everything can be found over at FranchiseSecrets.com. And if you want my help with anything from starting your own franchise to growing your current franchise business, please visit ScalableFranchise.com.